For today's In Focus, we travel to the Middle East and a site in the shadow of the Palestinian hills, the Tel Mound of Jericho. For it was here, in 1952, that archaeologist Kathleen Kenyon started an excavation which would uncover a remarkable burial tradition. A Tel site is a mound which is built up due to people repeatedly building on the same spot. Jericho is one of the oldest permanently settled places in the world, and it's not surprising that a Tel built up over time. Kenyon was not the first archaeologist to dig at Jericho. The site had been extensively explored by other folk, looking for proof of the events and places mentioned in the Bible. Famously, according to scripture, Jericho is where trumpets blared and mighty walls crashed to the ground. Though Kathleen wanted to document what she could of the biblical town, she suspected that the earlier phases of Jericho would prove more interesting. She was right. Jericho sits in a part of the world called the Fertile Crescent. It was in this crescent of fertile land that some of the first farmers experimented with cultivating crops. Jericho's origins lie in the crucial Natufian and so-called pre-pottery Neolithic. As you might suspect, the pre-pottery Neolithic is the Neolithic before the invention of pottery. It was the early sedentary Natufian culture who first experimented with growing grains in gardens of sorts. Also, legumes like lentils are found on Natufian sites. By the time of the pre-pottery Neolithic A, a scatter of circular houses covering about ten acres had grown up at Jericho. Remarkably, during this early phase, a stone wall and a large ditch cut into the bedrock surrounded the settlement on three sides. This 12-foot wall was enhanced by a 30-foot tower with an internal staircase. Kenyon believed that this mighty structure was built for defence, but later work has suggested it was built to divert floodwaters away from the village. By pre-pottery Neolithic B, multi-room rectilinear dwellings permitted population growth in an increasingly dense settlement. The inhabitants of Jericho, and other thriving pre-pottery Neolithic villages, did not make use of cemeteries to dispose of their dead. Rather, they buried their dead in the floors of their houses, and in the spaces between houses. Early burials took different forms. In some cases, individuals or several bodies were laid out, flexed, in pits. Other burials had red ochre sprinkled over the bodies, a practice seen across prehistory. In some cases, skulls have been painted, and the bones themselves are often scattered in disarray. But most striking of all, the skulls of adults, not juveniles, are often missing. For example, one small pit burial included nine jawbones, but no skulls, and only two articulated, or anatomically together, skeletons. In another instance, the bones of over 30 individuals were mixed up beneath a plastered floor. The relative location of these bones indicates that there would have been just enough sinew and ligaments to keep the bones connected. This suggests that bodies at Jericho were being briefly interred, just long enough to rot the flesh off the bones and then recover them. Or rather to recover selected skulls, for collections of these skulls indicates they played an important role in a cult of the ancestors. Some of these skulls were given plaster death masks or portraits of sorts. Constructed only during the pre-pottery Neolithic B, they modelled the faces of the dead, usually leaving the rear of the skull unplastered. Details of the face, including eyebrows, cheeks, nose and chin, were rendered in this plaster. For the eyes, shells were used, including clam and cowrie shell, to give a bright, living appearance. These eyes were far from crude. Examine here how the eyelids had been carefully placed over the shells. Other details, such as hairstyle and facial hair, would be painted on. And finally, a thin coat of plaster mixed with iron oxide gave the faces the rosy tint of the living. In recreating these faces of the dead, it was possible to invoke a whole family tree of ancestors. These portraits appear to have been intended for display amongst the living. Finds at other sites include pedestals upon which to place the skulls. Also found in the region are stone masks which appear to show elderly faces in a similar style. 
and Kathleen Kenyon herself uncovered nearly life-size clay figures at Jericho. These again may have been linked with invoking ancestors, recreating people from the past. The ultimate question is why? Why did people feel the need to invoke the long dead? Why attempt to reconstruct, breathe new life even, into the faces of the ancestors? An answer may lie in the use of land. This was a time when people became increasingly sedentary, investing in one place. With investment comes a sense of ownership, and what better way to demonstrate ownership than to show that you and your ancestors have been here for a long time. What we are seeing is quite possibly some of the earliest relationships between property and people being played out. And of course, from here, the ownership of land and farming was a game which became increasingly important. Essentially, the beginnings of an economy, an abstract sense of investment and a future gain. And ultimately, the foundations of much of Western society. Sites like Jericho changed the world forever. They are the roots of a so-called modern lifestyle. In building and rebuilding upon that land, people were staking a claim in the past for the future. They engineered the landscape, constructing impressive walls and a large tower. And by doing this, they acted and reenacted their hopes for the future, the harvest, for life, by looking beneath them to their ancestors. In this way, the Jericho skulls are not only haunting objects from the past, but remarkable artefacts from a new world a new way of life.